the very focal point of our whole belief system. Now here it comes. For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. How? What does your Bible say? Bodily. Not in spirit form. Not invisible. My, when he took off from the Mount of Olives, he left bodily. How bodily was he? When he had fish cooking on the fire up there in Galilee, and the disciples had caught nothing all night, and he asked the question, do you have any food? And they said, no. But what did he have cooking? Fish and bread. And then Luke tells us, plain as day, not just the disciples ate, but who? Jesus ate. He ate. How? Don't expect me to tell you how he digested it, but I know he ate. And yet in that same body, he went into the glory. In that same body, he's coming again. He's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. He's going to rule and reign bodily. Not some invisible enigma, but the man Christ Jesus, who is the mediator between man and God. The man Christ Jesus who sat down at the Father's right hand having finished the work of redemption. It was perfect. There wasn't one more thing that he could do. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felding, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felding. Okay, once again, it's good to have everybody in, and uh, we're ready to get into the second half hour this afternoon, and... Uh, for those of you joining us on television, you'll notice they all got their coffee cups. So when you come through Tulsa, you can enjoy an afternoon of taping with us while you can be part and parcel of, of all this activity. We have a lot of good fellowship throughout the afternoon. Okay, again, we always like to remind our audience that uh, we're just an informal Bible study. Uh, one of the first stipulations that I made sure they understood when they first asked if I would do this, I will not wear a suit and tie. And, uh, of course, now my short sleeve shirt, I think, has become my trademark. And uh, when we go to some of these seminars, and I will on the Sunday services wear my suit and tie, people actually do not appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, anyway, that's the reason you see a blackboard. Uh, we hopefully keep it a teaching situation. And uh, we always appreciate the response that we're getting, the prayers and the financial help. Because after all, a lot of people still do not understand that we do pay for TV time. And I guess my wife was one. When we first started, she said, you mean we have to pay them? <laughs> and, uh, but that's the name of the game. So we do appreciate the help that we get from all of you out there. All right. Let's get right back to where we left off in our last half hour. And that was in Hebrews chapter 7. We'll go on now to verse 25. And I just told the girls sitting on the front row, we probably won't even get past verse 25 in this half hour because this, again, is a loaded verse. Loaded. Wherefore. Now remember, whenever Paul used that word wherefore, what does it do? Send you back ahead what he just got through saying. And he's just been telling us that this man, the man Christ Jesus, God the Son, who had finished the work of salvation in his death, burial, and resurrection, this man, verse 24, has an unchangeable priesthood. He's immutable. He never changes. Just because he took on flesh 
suffered and died doesn't mean that he ever stopped being the eternal, sovereign, creator, God of the universe. Wherefore, see, because of all that. Wherefore, he, this son, is able also to save them to the uttermost. In other words, completely, not just partially. He is able to save them to the uttermost. Now again, who? Those that come unto God by him. Not some other way. Not some other way. John's gospel tells us that if they try to come in some other way, they are what? They're a thief and a robber. And so there is only this one way. Now we're living in a time where that doesn't go down easy. I'll probably get kicked off television someday for standing on this premise that it's an exclusive gospel. It is not just one of many. The scripture is adamant that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The scripture is also adamant that this is the only way that God will accept mankind. And so here we have it. Because of who this man, Christ Jesus, with a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, because of who he is, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come unto God by or through him. And the reason being that he ever liveth for all eternity, from past to future, Consequently, he can make intercession or be the constant comfort for those who have placed their faith in him. Now, I'm going to take the time because I get so many phone calls over and over asking, well, how do I experience this salvation that you're talking about? I always feel as though I make it plain, but evidently I'm not making it plain enough for a lot of people. And so again, we're going to stop for a few moments and just show how to enter into this great salvation that is completed at the moment that we're saved. We don't just partially, but we have to do it God's way, not some denomination's idea, not my idea, but God's way. And the best way is to just go back and search the scriptures. All right, let's go back again to where we were in our last program in Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, and this is a point that someone reminded me of just the other day and said, Les, do you realize that most people do not understand that they're lost from their day of birth? Well, I always thought that was a given. <coughs> no, he said, most people don't realize that. They think that they're pretty good and that until they really start living an awful life that they can recognize they're sinners. But... That's not the way the book puts it. The book tells us that because of Adam, every human being born into the human race is a born sinner. And we know that God's grace covers those little ones, and they'll be in glory. I'm confident of that. But as soon as a human being gets to an age of understanding right from wrong, he becomes responsible and he is guilty until God declares him innocent. All right, let's just take a few moments then to chase this down. Let's start in Romans chapter 3, and uh, we can just pick up where we left off in this so uh, portion of Scripture in the last half hour. We used verses 19 and 20, you remember. But now let's look at verse 21. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. And again, that flip side word. Even though the law up there in 19 and 20 was only good for making mankind guilty, but now. Now you see, Paul uses those two words over and over. Ephesians chapter 2 is another one. But God. And then on uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 13. But now. Why? Because all of a sudden, on this side of the cross, on this side of his resurrection power, my, what a different ballgame. See, that's why I maintain that Christ couldn't preach this kind of a gospel in his earthly ministry. He hadn't died yet. And the disciples had no idea he was going to, even though he knew they didn't. But on this side of the cross, now it's a proclaimed truth that he has died for the sins of the world. All right, so verse 21 now, but now. 
the righteousness of God. Not man's righteousness, God's righteousness without the law is manifested. It's put up in the spotlight. And of course, we're not going to throw our Old Testament away because all of this that I'm teaching has its roots back there in the Old Testament and it is manifested and witnessed by the law and the prophets, the writers of the Old Testament. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith or the faith in Jesus Christ. See, he is the epitome of our faith system. And it goes unto all and upon all them that believe, plus what? Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing more added. To all them who believe. For there is no difference. Well, of course, Paul is writing to Jews as well as Gentiles. And, of course, the fact that Jews had a hard time swallowing was that now in this age of grace, there's no difference. A Jew has to be saved just exactly like we Gentiles. He has to come the same way because of this no difference. Now then, verse 23, I always call the first step of saving faith. This is where every one of us who have been saved now forever so long, this is where we all began. And that is that we had to recognize that according to God's word and according to God's look at who we are, we were sinners. For all, not just some, all, even the best of the human race, even those who are so malevolent and they are so good, but their nature is sin-oriented. And so all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now I think uh, maybe some other translations put it that all have missed the mark. We haven't hit the bullseye. We're missing the mark. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All right, now stop right there, man. Keep your hand in Romans. Flip all the way over to Corinth, no, chapter 5. Uh, still in Romans. I'm sorry. Still in Romans, chapter 5. <clears throat> Just about got confused my mind with another verse in 1 Corinthians, but let's use this one. Romans, chapter 5, verse 12. Romans, chapter 5, verse 12. Now, this is what the book says. This isn't my idea. This isn't some denomination's idea. This is what God's Word says. Romans 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man, not one woman, one man, sin entered into the world, and death came along with it, and death by sin. And so, because of Adam's disobedience, so death passed upon how many? All men, not just the worst, all men, the whole human race, for all have what? Sinned. All have sinned. Every human being, black and white, rich or poor, oriental or western, makes no difference. The whole human race is included in these words, all. Death has passed upon all. Sin has been declared as part of all. And it's nothing more that we can add or take away that Adam precipitated all of this curse that we call sin and death. Don't so never forget that. By one man, Adam, sin entered, and with it, death came as well. Well, we could look at some more. Uh, let me go ahead and go to 1 Corinthians, where I was going to go a moment ago. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 <clears throat> Corinthians 15. I'm dropping all the way over to verse 45. Remember, 1 Corinthians 15 is the tremendous resurrection chapter. But here again, we have to show this difference between Adam, who sent the whole human race under the curse and under sin and death, as compared to the second Adam, Christ, who made provision to bring every human being out of it. 
as we saw back in Hebrews. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written. All got it? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, was made or created a living soul. The last Adam, which is a reference to Jesus Christ, was a quickening or a life-giving spirit. See? Then drop down to verse 47. The first man, Adam, is of the earth. He's earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as is the earthy, verse 48, such are they also that are earthy, those of us of the race of Adam. But we shall also bear the image of the heavenly once we enter into God's tremendous saving grace. And without it, we are doomed for total separation. All right, now if you'll flip back to Romans chapter 3, because we're going to spend, I think, most of this half hour on that verse that says, Wherefore he is able also to save to the uttermost those who come unto God by him. Well, the only way we can come to God is as a sinner. We can't come to God and say, now look, I'm just here to bargain. I want to get as good a deal as I can. I'm not all that bad, but I might as well get as much as I can. Uh -uh. Every human being has to come before God recognizing that he has missed the mark. He's a sinner. He's lost. And uh, we're walking dead people, dead spiritually. All right, now then verse 24 immediately. It's just like back in Genesis 3. Just as soon as man fell, God comes right back and sets in motion a plan of redemption, promising the seed of the woman. See? Same way here. Just as soon as Paul declares every human being a sinner, the very next verse, he gives us that escape route. Isn't it glorious? And the fact that most people won't take it, that, that's even worse. But nevertheless, here we have it, now being justified, declared just as if we've never sinned, being justified freely. See all these words and how loaded they are? We're not justified because we've earned it. We're not justified because we really deserve it. No, we're justified freely by His grace. And what's grace? Unmerited favor. God doesn't justify us because we have one ounce of dessert. He justifies only because of His grace. And that grace was epitomized, it was brought to the crescendo through the redemption or the process of buying us back that is in Christ Jesus. Now let's mull that over a minute. Through the grace of God, when we recognized that we were a sinner, God could come right back immediately and say, that's fine. I know you're lost, but I've already bought you back. You remember years ago? Year, oh, my goodness, we've been on TV years. Do you realize that? Years ago, I gave the story of the little boy who had made a boat. Some of you remember. I'll bet Sharon does. Uh, I should tell our whole television audience, Sharon is now doing our... Uh, our, uh, closed captioning. Yeah, closed captioning. Couldn't even think of the word. Sharon is doing the closed captioning workforce, which is laborious. So she knows what I'm talking about because she's probably been seeing it for the last several weeks. But anyway, this little fellow uh, had made a boat, spent months making this tremendous little boat. So one day his parents took him out to the seaside, and he started sailing his boat, and he was just having a ball with it. But as kids are prone to do, you know, his mind was suddenly changed to something else, and he ran off and left his boat and did something, and when he came back, it was gone. His little boat was gone, and he was just heartbroken. But months later, he and his mom were walking down the street, and they went by a pawn shop, and in the window of that pawn shop was his boat. Beautiful. Hadn't been hurt a bit. And he said, Mommy, i got to go in here. So he takes off into the pawn shop, and he runs up to the fellow at the counter, and he says, I want my boat. Said, what are you talking about? That boat out in the window, it's mine, I made it. And the fellow says, sorry, buddy, but he said, I've got money in that boat. 
He says, you can have it when you pay the price. Well, how much? Well, whatever it was, the little fellow went out and told his mom, he says, I've got to work. And so he did. He mowed lawns, he raked leaves, he scooped snow, he did everything he could until he finally had the enough money to go back to that pawn shop. And he bought his boat. Now you're getting the picture. He made it, he worked for it, he lost it, and now he had to do a work so he could buy it back. And as he was carrying it out the door, he said to his mama with tears running down his cheeks, Mama, this boat that I made, I've bought it back, and now it's mine. Well, you see, that's exactly what God has done. He made us, he created us, but he lost us. Where? When Adam fell. Now, when I'm teaching Genesis, you know, I make it very profound that every human being was in Adam. And because of Adam's rebellion, we all have inherited that sin nature, and that's why we're born sinners. And so God lost us when he lost Adam. And now he has paid the price of redemption through that work of the cross. Like the little boy who had to go and do all the various menial jobs, Christ in turn did it when he went to the cross. And so he paid the price of redemption. But remember, whenever we present salvation to the human race, it's always on the basis, yes, it's all done. The price has been paid. Forgiveness has been declared. Reconciliation has been declared. But you cannot appropriate it without coming by faith. It's not an automatic. Now, you know, there are people that try to teach that everybody will make it sooner or later because of all this. No, no. Because God has demanded that we accept all this by faith, plus nothing, with no works, with nothing, except recognizing that, yes, I'm a fallen creature. I'm a sinner because I'm a son of Adam. But I believe that Christ has done everything that needs to be done. And when we do that, then God in grace reaches down and does everything that needs to be done. I guess I've been putting it on the program in the mornings lately, huh? All the things that God did the moment we believed. Oh, he justified, he sanctified, he glorified, he forgave us, placed us into the body, gave us the Holy Spirit. And I think I had probably 15 or 20 things that God did the moment we were saved. It's done. That's what Hebrews means. He saved us to the uttermost. He didn't do just part of it and say, well, if you measure up, I'll finish it. No, he did it all. And that's the whole idea of salvation. All right, now then, let's move on just a little bit further here in chapter 3. Verse 26. <clears throat> I want to skip verse 25 because that big word propitiation might scare somebody. <clears throat> but verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time, his, not ours, his righteousness, that he, God, might be just, which means exactly what it says. He's not cutting corners. He's not making a deal. He is totally just. <clears throat> and he is the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus and, 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 does it? No. Isn't that glorious? It's so simple. Now, I don't oversimplify. Now, when I say when we believe it, I mean we totally, totally trust in it. Now, you remember a few weeks ago we were in Hebrews chapter 6, and I made it so clear that a lot of people make a flyby at it. They're enlightened, they have a taste, but it never takes and they go right back into their old lifestyle. But for the believer who totally, totally relies on this finished work of the cross, then God has guaranteed that we're his forever, as long as he lives. All right, back up a page <clears throat> to Romans chapter 1. Come back to Romans chapter 1 a moment. Another tremendous salvation verse that I think we've used over and over through the years. Romans 1, verse 16. Romans 1, verse 16. That well-known verse, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, 
of Jesus Christ. For it is the gospel. <clears throat> it is the power of God unto salvation. And again, to everyone that what? Believeth. Plus, 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 no. To everyone that believeth. And of course it includes Jew as well as Gentile. Oh my goodness, there are so many of these, especially in Romans. And uh, let's go on a little further. I'm going to go ahead and use this half hour for this because 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. Oh my goodness, what a statement. Now this is God's word. This isn't me. Like I said a moment ago, this isn't from some denominational book. This is from the book. And Paul, writing to a Gentile congregation down in wicked Corinth, says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The same one that Romans 1.16 referred to, how that Christ died, shed his blood, was buried, and rose from the dead. All right, so he sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, in other words, not with smooth, silver-tongued oratory, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Now here's the verse I want you to see, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross. Let that sink in. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish, the lost world. Yes, to them it's foolishness. Today they would probably say, you mean to tell me that somebody that was on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago has anything to do with me? Oh, I can't believe that. Well, then they're perishing. So for those who hear the preaching of the cross and they perish, it's foolishness. But, boy, we're hitting a lot of these today, aren't we? Another flip side. But the other side of the coin is, unto us who are saved, to those of us who have latched on to this great salvation, the preaching of the cross is the power of God. Years back, I made the statement on the program, and I haven't said it lately, so I'm, I'm going to repeat it. When God saves a sinner, whether it's me or you or a mafia or a well-heeled, real nice socialite, makes no difference. It takes more power to save that person out of the clutches of sin and death than to create the universe. Now that may be a play on words, but nevertheless, hopefully it'll sink in. That's why Paul is always emphasizing the power of Christ's resurrection. When he defeated all the forces of Satan and death and hell and set us free from it. And it took tremendous power because, listen, Satan is powerful. Now, he's not as powerful as God, but he's powerful. And he's not going to let go of anybody without a fight. And I think most of us have experienced it. And uh, we're, we're plagued with doubts. And that's the satanic power, see? And so always remember that the preaching of the Christ is to us who are saved the power of God. Well, I think we can just come down in this same chapter and finish out the half hour. And uh, let's go down to verse 21 here in chapters 1 of Corinthians. Verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, the philosophers, the intellectuals, the world by wisdom knew not God. But it pleased God by the foolishness, as the world calls it. He uh, was pleased with the preaching to save them that again, what? Believe. Plus, 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 no. To them that believe. All right, then uh, next verse. For the Jews require a sign. Now that's evident. All the way through their history, they had to have a sign in order to understand that God was in it. And so they required a sign. And the Greeks were seeking after wisdom, the philosophy, and all that. But 
unto those of us who are called, it's Christ, the power of God. And there's that power again, the same power that caused him to uh, perform the miracles, but now that's been imparted unto us by virtue of our faith and the wisdom of God which beats any intellectual power on earth. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, ready to roll. Good to see everybody again. And uh, again, we'd like to uh, welcome our television audience, regardless of where you are or what time of the day. We just trust that uh, you can sit down and study your Scriptures with us and... Uh, as the Bereans of old, they did this to show that the Word of God was true. And uh, that's all we ask. We don't try to uh, force people to agree with us. <clears throat> I always have a cliche that I've used for many, many years. Convince a man against his will and he's unconvinced still. So uh, we just trust that the Holy Spirit will do the work. Now again, for those of you out in television, if you want a copy of this particular program, Here's our formula now. We are in book number 50, and uh, that's much as you really have to have in order to order the books and tapes and so forth. All right, I think we're ready to get back into Hebrews chapter 7, and we're still on this priesthood of Christ after the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> Remembering, I've got to keep repeating it, that we're dealing primarily with Jewish people who were still having a hard time separating themselves from any part of Judaism. And that's understandable. You know, it's no different for people today, especially if they've been in a cult and they've been brainwashed <coughs> for a lifetime. And then to see these truths, that all of that that they've been taught was contrary to Scripture, it's not easy to just turn their back on it and uh, be quit of it. And so this is exactly the mentality of these Jews. They had been steeped in Judaism, the Old Testament, and then to have to accept the fact that all that has been fulfilled, it's got to be laid aside, wasn't easy. And uh, always keep that in mind. But at the same time, as Paul writes in uh, Romans, that all these things were written for our learning. And so I trust we are, even as we study Hebrews, <clears throat> that we're learning a lot of the things that pertain even to us today. All right, so let's just jump in at verse uh, 25, where we finished the last half hour, but use it as a flow. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. In other words, by believing that finished work of the cross, seeing he ever liveth, to make intercession for them. Now, I didn't really get time to comment on that last part of the verse, but <clears throat> it's just simply to tell us that God will never stop being all that we need. Even when we get to the eternal state, when there is no longer the necessity for interceding for us as we struggle through this life, yet the confidence that we have is that this relationship with our great high priest will never end. It is forever and ever and ever. All right, now then, we can go into verse 26. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Now, if you'll just analyze that for a moment. 
Could any of that apply to a priest of Levi? No, no human can measure up to this. This was something that only Christ himself could fulfill. And that's the kind of a high priest we have. He is harmless, undefiled, totally separated from sinners. He didn't have that old sin nature that we're born with. He was always gone and, of course, made higher than the heavens. Now then, verse 27, who needeth not daily as those high priests. See how this is constantly showing us that he's talking to Jews and they knew, they knew the role of the priesthood in Judaism. The ordinary priest who went in the daily ministrations of the sanctuary from the uh, altar out there at the gate and then the stop at the labor of cleansing and then into the little front room of the sanctuary wherein there was the table of showbread. That had to be changed every day. And uh, the candle holder, that had to be trimmed and filled with oil every day. The altar of incense, that had to be kept burning with incense. And that was their routine day in and day out. And uh, from the human element, and of course, when they died, someone else would have to take their place. All right, but every day, they would have to go through the ritual of this uh, maintaining the temple worship. All right, and so they would first offer sacrifice for their own sin because they too were sinners, even though they were priests. And then for the peoples, that is the nation of Israel. But Christ didn't have to do that. He didn't have to maintain a daily ritual because, you see, he did it once. Now, I've always stressed when I teach Hebrews, look for the number of times where it tells us that Christ did these things once. Once for all, as the old hymn put it. All right, so for this he did once when he offered up himself. And we're going to see in another chapter where the blood of animals, bulls and goats couldn't do it. But his singular sacrifice finished everything. All right, now then verse 28. For the law, the Mosaic law, maketh men high priests who have infirmity. They're human. They're going to sin, they're going to fail, and one day they're going to die, and they're out of the priesthood. All right, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, in other words, his priesthood kicked in after the work of the cross, not before. And as I mentioned in the last program, that it's on this side of the cross that our salvation is consummated because he had to die. He had to be buried. And he had to arise in resurrection power in order for our salvation to be possible. Now, a lot of folks have a hard time understanding that when I maintain the four Gospels cannot have our Gospel because Christ hadn't died yet, I think some try to come back with, well, they must have known that he was going to. Oh, did they? Well, turn back with me to Luke 18. Luke 18. And let the Scripture speak for itself. And this is not the only place. This is just one of the easier ones to remember. In Luke 18... <coughs> Drop in at verse 31, honey. Luke 18, verse 31. So if you're ever appealing to some lost person on some of these things, and then they come back and say, oh, well, they must have known that he was going to die. They knew that he was going to rise from the dead. No, they didn't. They had no idea. Now, granted, the Old Testament did now after the fact. See, we can go back into the Old Testament, and we can see that, it was evident that Christ would die and be resurrected. But his followers didn't know that. All right, you got it? Luke 31, uh, 18, verse 31. This is toward the end of his earthly ministry. They've been with him now three years, and they're on their way back up to Jerusalem for the final days. Then he took unto him the twelve, and he said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, all things that are written by the prophets 
concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. They'll all be fulfilled. And we know they were. And now to see that he knew exactly what was coming. He tells them, For he, speaking of himself, shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, which for remember, remember the Romans. And he shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. They shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. Now look at verse 34. Those of you who have been in my classes, you know these verses, but a lot of people out there don't know this. Look what the scripture says. And they, the twelve, who had been with him now for three years, and they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Well, you know, I always ask the question, who hid it? God did. It wasn't for them to know. Because can you imagine what these 12 men would have done even in these intervening days between this and the crucifixion if they would have known? It would have just upset the whole apple cart. But they didn't know. And you remember the events at the crucifixion? How that they ran for their life? They scattered, as I've said before, like a flock of quail? But it wasn't until after the resurrection that Peter got bold as bold can be. Because now with the power of resurrection, confirming, regardless of what those Romans could do to him, he had resurrection power. He had resurrection life. He had nothing to fear. But they did not know. And all you have to do is, is just search your memory. My, when they put those Roman guards around the tomb, did the eleven and did Mary and Martha and some of those just camp out a little further away and wait? No, they weren't around. They had no idea he was going to be raised from the dead. And then you remember in John chapter 20, when Mary Magdalene comes to anoint the body, as was the custom, did she have any idea he would be raised from the dead? Well, of course not. It just took them all by surprise, even though the Old Testament was adamant that he would be raised from the dead. And so always remember these things, that it wasn't until after the death, burial, and resurrection that this amazing gospel of grace was able to be promoted. And even then, for the first several years after, and Peter and the others are proclaiming to Israel, they don't attach salvation to this death, burial, and resurrection. All they can understand is that the king can still be what he promised to be because he's not dead, he's alive. But it isn't until the apostle Paul comes that he has now the revelation that this has become the gospel for the salvation of the whole human race, not just for Israel, not just for the Gentiles, but for everyone. And through all of that then, we come up with this high priest after the order of Melchizedek. All right, now verse 28 again. For the law maketh men high priests who have infirmity, they're going to die. But the word of the oath which was since the law, on this side of the cross, makes the Son, who well, we've been emanating all the way through Hebrews, this makes the Son who is consecrated or has finished everything forevermore. Nothing more now needs to be done. Everything that God required to satisfy the sins of mankind is accomplished. Now, I'm sure very few of us, and I certainly don't even claim to understand myself, the workings of the mind of God with regard to the shed blood and the forgiveness. Now, we understand the workings of it, but the very mind of God behind it, why, why did he have to have a blood sacrifice? Oh, I've got an idea, but to be able to just sit down and lay it out so that almost anybody can... No, I can't do that. 
But there are a lot of things. In fact, we were just talking about the triune God, what we call the Trinity. Now, there again, the word Trinity isn't in your Bible. But the whole concept of a triune God is, and uh, listen, there's no way you can understand that except by faith. We just can't fathom it. How can three personalities be in three different places and yet operate as one? I can't understand it, but I can believe it. I know it because the book says it. In fact, I was just telling somebody at break time. You know, the more I look at all this, the more I understand, had God not been a triune God, none of this would have worked. You ever thought of that? It wouldn't have worked. Because, you see, while Christ was dead on the cross, if he was the only person of the Godhead, then God would have been what? Dead. Who would have called him from the tomb if he was the only one? Nobody. But you see, we have a triune God. And while Christ was dead and in the tomb and everything, we still had God the Father and God the Spirit with all the power necessary to raise him from the dead. Well, the same way when Christ went back to glory. Who came down? The Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit as the third person of Trinity, my, we'd be destitute of a lot of these things. And so we have to have everything just exactly the way God laid it out. But... It's hard to understand unless we can take it by faith. The Bible says it. The Bible teaches it. And we rest on that, even though we can't understand it. All right, now the same way. The Son now has been set at the right hand of the majesty on high. And uh, we pick that up now in chapter 8, verse 1. Now, on this side of the cross, now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Don't you like that? I'm going to recap, Paul said. Now, this is the sum of the matter. We still use the statement today. This is the sum of the matter. We have, not hope to have, we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne. Now, I always emphasize to people, Christ is not on a throne tonight. That's why we don't address him as king. He's not a king on the throne. That's still future when he returns. But he's at the Father's right hand. And again, I always like to emphasize, don't picture him sitting on a little chair and, and God the Father's up here on some big throne. Uh, that's not what we're to do. But positionally, positionally in the heavenlies, we have God the Son, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, placed at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, maybe Daniel chapter 7 will help a little bit in that. And again, this just points out the fact that all Scripture dovetails together. None of it stands off by itself. But in Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> we have a little different view. And yet it's all the same thing. You see, that's the beauty of Scripture. We get all these different viewpoints pointing up the same thing. Daniel chapter 7, and let's look at verse 9 first. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. Now, I'm just doing this to show that Scripture fits with Scripture. And Hebrews has just told us again that he's at the right hand of the majesty. All right, verse 9 of Daniel 7, I beheld until the thrones were cast down, that is, all earthly thrones, and the Ancient of Days did sit. Now that's a little different title, isn't it? Which, of course, is a reference to God the Father. The Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne, that is, his place of authority, his throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. Now there again, that's just beyond our human understanding. Verse 10, just to give us a little glimpse of this throne room of heaven, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Now look at this next statement. Thousand, thousands, that's millions. Millions ministered unto him. Well, millions of what? Angels, the angelic host, thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. See? 
And then, of course, we leap to the end of the ages when the white throne judgment is set and the books were opened. But that's beside the point for us today. Now jump over to verse 13. Now over to verse 13. And again Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the sun. See, there it is, capitalized. Way back here in the Old Testament, here we have the sun. The Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Now, what are those clouds? Are angelic hosts, as I think? That's probably debatable, but whatever. He came with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, the same one as he's spoken of in verse 9, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him the Son, dominion and glory, and a kingdom. This, of course, is leading up to his millennial reign, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and a kingdom which shall not be destroyed. Well, that's not what we're making the point. What I want you to see is this relationship between God the Father on the throne at this time and God the Son as he comes before him. All right, so now back to Hebrews chapter 8, you've got this same picture. How that this high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Where's heaven? Well, when you find out, you tell me. We don't know, but it's out there someplace. It's real. It's visible, it's physical, and one day we're going to be there. And I think we're getting closer all the time. All right, and so verse 2, back in Hebrews 8. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now, I'm going to take a twofold approach to that. As a minister of the sanctuary, it could possibly take the point that God the Son is at the very core of the body of Christ. He is the core of the true dwelling place of God, which is you and I as believers. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, maybe somebody out there in television has never heard of this before. Maybe we better go back. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You know, I always got to keep reminding. I've told Iris more than once, you know, as I teach these programs, I, I have a big hang-up. I feel if I've taught it once, everybody knows it. <laughs> but on the other hand, I have to realize that we got new listeners coming in every time, and a lot of our listeners have only heard it once, and that's not enough. So bear with me, and uh, we'll repeat some of these basic fundamentals of the faith over and over. All right, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know you not that you... Now remember, Paul always writes to believers. <clears throat> know you not that you are the temple, see, the dwelling place. You are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. That's what makes us what we are. All right, come over to chapter 6 in the same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and it's repeated, verse 19. All got it? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What, Paul writes, Know you not that your body, this physical body of flesh and bone, that your body is the temple or the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit who is in you, which you have of God? You're not your own. Why? Because we've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Well, now I have never gotten on the soapbox and jump at people for their bad habits. But when a believer continues to practice a bad habit, what is going to be the end result physically? Well, he's going to lose his health. 
He's going to lose his health probably faster than, than the unbeliever because we are defiling something that is no longer ours. It's God. So you believers out there that think you can smoke and enjoy it, you go ahead. But I had one lady call one time and she said, Les, I just can't quit these stupid cigarettes. Does that mean that I'll go to hell? And I said, no, it just means you're going to get to heaven quicker than you would have otherwise. <laughs> But see, this is exactly what we have to realize, that we are to treat this body special. We are to take care of it. We're to nurture it. And Paul says in Ephesians, we're to love it because this is what God has given us. It's his dwelling place. All right, now then, if you can come back, we've only got a few minutes left again. Hebrews chapter 8. So he's a minister of the sanctuary, first and foremost, this temple in which he is dwelling in the person of the Holy Spirit. But... So far as the Jew was concerned, he's still got the temple on his mind, hasn't he? And the temple, of course, was divided with the front part, the sanctuary, which, if I remember correctly, was 30 feet by about 15. And in the back behind the veil was 15 feet by 15. And that's what the Jew understood. But this man, this high priest, is a minister of the true, not the the temple there in Jerusalem. Now, again, as I was looking at all this the last few evenings, you've got to remember the temple is still operating in Jerusalem when this is being written. See, too many of us have got the idea that the temple is long gone and uh, it doesn't play a role. Yeah, it still was. It was still operating when Paul is writing his letters. And, uh, of course, it's destroyed just within a matter of two or three years after his death. But as Paul writes, the temple is still going, as I say, full speed ahead. They were sacrificing animals by the thousands, see? And so the Jew had that temple on his mind when anything was brought up religiously, as they would call it. And so here again, Paul is addressing that that this high priest is not of that temple operating up there on the mount, but of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. What's he talking about? Well, come all the way back to Exodus chapter 25. And again, I think this is a concept that very few professing believers, unless they've become students, understand. Exodus 25, where the Lord is going to give Moses instructions for building that first little tabernacle out in the wilderness, that little tent, which, of course, became later the temple. But all right, in Exodus chapter 25, and he gives all the materials that they're going to need in the first eight verses. Now look at verse 9. According to all that I show you, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. What's a pattern? It's the original. Manufacturers have what they call prototypes. What is it? Well, it's just a, a similar, similar of what they're going to have at the end. What's God telling Moses? You're going to make a tabernacle patterned after an original, not pitched with hands, Hebrews says, but where is it? In the heavens. And so there is a likeness of the temple format in the heavens, not made by men, but created by God himself. And it was into that temple that Christ went again as our high priest. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760-74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures. 
teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, there we are. Good to see everybody. And, uh, oh, we've kept just about everybody all afternoon. This is our fourth program. For those of you out in television, we tape four of these in a row, so this is why it's always kind of encouraging that they don't leave me in the middle of the afternoon. But, uh, anyway, we're in a... Uh, Bible study. We don't preach at people. I don't try to twist arms, and yet the Lord has seen fit to use us to win so many. My goodness, you have no idea how many men, especially. I think the Lord has just given us such a ministry amongst men that will come up and uh, tell us, you just totally changed my life. Well, I don't do it. God does it. But uh, whatever. It's kind of thrilling that uh, we hear the testimony of so many men who have come out of a life with no interest in spiritual things whatsoever. And then uh, catch fire. And uh, one gentleman told me the other day, he said, Les, I never prayed. And he says, now I just talk to the Lord all day long. Well, you know, nothing thrills us more. So... Uh, Pray with us that uh, the Lord will just continue to use His Word. And as I've said on this program over and over, <clears throat> when Acts recorded that God opened the heart of Lydia so that she attended to the things spoken by Paul. Well, that's all I can ask for. God, just give me Lydia's, whether they're men or women, boys or girls, give me Lydia's, whose heart you've opened that they will listen to what we have to say. All right, Hebrews. Chapter 8, and let's see, Jerry, he's got uh, chapter 8, verse 3. But uh, again, I don't like to just jump in. Let's go back a verse or two. We might as well go back to verse 1 of chapter 8, and then we'll pick it up at verse 3. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Remember I told you in the last program that could take a two-way approach. He could be speaking of the body uh, of us as believers who is the temple of the Holy Spirit and he is the very core and the makeup of that. But it could also be talking to a reference to the Old Testament tabernacle or temple which was set in those two various, uh, two rooms, the sanctuary and the Holy of Holies, and which was pitched according to the pattern in heaven. And we'll look at that again when we get down a little further in this chapter. All right, now verse 3. <clears throat> For every priest, whether it was of the Aaronic or whether it's this high priest, for Every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifice, wherefore it is of necessity that this man, again we're referring to Christ, the priest after the order of Melchizedek, so even as those priests who offered, so also must this man have somewhat to offer. He has to have a reason for fulfilling his priesthood. Verse 4. For if he were on earth, now that's a big if, he's not, but if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. He couldn't do that. See that? He couldn't operate in his priesthood if he had to do as Israel's priests did because it just wouldn't fit. He could not offer animal sacrifices. He could not fulfill the priesthood in the temple because his work was so totally, totally above and beyond the animal sacrifices of Judaism. All right, now then, verse 5. These priests of Israel, Judaism, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. In other words, God is making sure that Moses builds that tabernacle according to the floor plan of the original, which is in heaven. Now, we looked at it in the last moments of our last program, and we're going to look at it again in a moment. All right, verse 5, reading on. So as Moses is about to build that tabernacle out there at Mount Sinai, in the wilderness, the Lord spoke and said, See, take note that thou make all things according to the pattern 
showed to thee in the mount. Now let's go back for again just a quick review of where we were in the last program, but a different verse. Let's go to chapter 25, and I think the last verse of the chapter, honey. Verse 40. Exodus 25, verse 40. Exodus 25, verse 40. <clears throat> the last program, we looked at Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9. But now we're going to look at the last verse. And this just shows the importance of it. Moses could not take this lightly. He couldn't just throw up a tent and build an altar and start killing animals. It all had to be according to God's divine purposes. And those of you who have studied the tabernacle with me, remember that everything, everything, with nothing accepted, was all a picture of this work of the cross. Every instrument in the sanctuary, every bolt of cloth, every piece of gold and silver, it all spoke of the coming of the work of the cross. So this is why God was so adamant that Moses did everything particularly. All right, verse 40 of Exodus 25, and God says, and look, make sure that thou make them, that is, all the things that are going into this tabernacle, that thou make them after their pattern. In other words, you couldn't just makeshift it. It had to be exactly as God had given him the pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. In other words, when he was up there in Mount Sinai. All right, now then, when you come to the last book of Exodus... Chapter 40, honey. Verse 33. And again, the language is such that just sends you flying to the finished work of the cross. Now, all these intervening chapters, they've been crafting the materials that went into this tabernacle, the gold, the linen, the animal's hair, the altar of, uh, of incense and the brazen altar made of brass, all these things were crafted by craftsmen that God had raised up out of the Israelites. All right, now you come to the end of this book of Exodus. In verse 33, he, Moses, reared up the court round about the tabernacle, in other words, the outer fence that went clear around the perimeter, and the altar set up the hanging of the court gate. In other words, that was the last thing that was finished. So Moses, what's the word? Finished. Moses finished the work. And then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In other words, God put his stamp of approval upon everything that the Israelites had now made with their craftsmanship, and they erected it and set it up. And verse 35, the presence of God was so awesome that Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tent. Tabernacle. Well, anyway, all of that was set in motion to give us a preview of what Christ would accomplish in his work of the cross. All right, back to Hebrews once again. Finishing verse 5. For see, he saith, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount, up there in Mount Sinai everything exactly as God had instructed. Now verse 6, here we come again. What's the word? But the flip side, yes, Moses and all the craftsmen of Israel worked almost a year formulating all the things that went in to that earthly tabernacle there out in uh, the foot of Mount Sinai. But now, see, but now, on this side, he hath obtained a more excellent ministry. 
by how much also he is the mediator of a what? Better. Do you see the constant comparison of that which was good? The Mosaic system, the Mosaic law, yes, it was good up to a point, but it could not be perfect. But now, now on this side, we have that which is perfect because Christ himself established it and finished it. And so he has become the mediator, back in verse 6, of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. My, aren't we fortunate? You know, I, I try to impress on people, you and I as believers in this age of grace, as members of the body of Christ, have it so far above the promises made to Israel. Now, we know God's going to do wondrous things yet with Israel someday, but the promises that he has given to us as believers, as members of the body of Christ, are beyond comprehension. You and I can't begin to get a glimpse of the glory that's going to be revealed to us because all this is so much better than what God promised Israel. All right, now verse 7. Right off the bat, I see something that just thrills me to death. For if that first covenant had been faultless. You know what I'm going to ring the bell on? Was it faultless? No, it was full of fault. My, it was weak, it was beggarly, see? That first covenant was faultless. But if it hadn't been, had it been faultless, had it been perfect, then there'd be no reason for a second one. That stands to reason, doesn't it? What's our expression? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you got something that's perfect, leave it alone. You know, I, uh, I wrote to a car maker one time. I had an automobile that, boy, I thought it was as close to perfect as humans could make it. And they dropped that one. In fact, it's the one I've been driving. Got 230-some thousand miles on it. I thought it was as perfect a car as automobiles could be made. And then that's the one they dropped from their line. And I wrote to the company. I don't suppose you got any further than the round file, but I wrote. I said, for the first time in the history of your company, you made an automobile that is almost perfect, and then you drop it. I said, typical American business. <laughs> but nevertheless, see, when something is perfect, you don't have to ask for anything more. But the law and temple worship wasn't perfect. It was full of faults. And so consequently, there had to be room for a second. Now let's go into verse 8, and then I'm going to stop and digress. For finding fault with them. Who did? God did. God found fault with his own system of law. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day, and I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, which was the covenant of law, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Now just stop and rehearse for a minute. As soon as Israel came through the Red Sea and they congregate down there at the base of Mount Sinai, and God calls Moses up into the mount and gives him the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to even skip over the horrors of what took place when he came down and he broke the first set. But later on he gets the second set, set in stone, and Israel comes under the law. They've got that beautiful little tent out in the wilderness. They now have a priesthood. Hey, they're ready to go. They've got everything going for them. The Shekinah glory is right up there above the tabernacle. Can you imagine it? Can you picture it? The presence of God is right there above them. A cloud by day to give them shade in that desert heat. It was a pillar of fire by night to protect them from any predators. Boy, they had it made. And so God leads them up to Kadesh Barnea. And what happened? Oh, they floundered and they failed in what? Unbelief. 
you remember when we were back there in chapter 3 of Hebrews? I made mention of the fact that there's probably no other concept of Scripture that is repeated so often as how disgusted God was with Israel when they would not go in and take the promised land, all because of their unbelief. Well, what was part of the problem? The system of law. It was not perfect, see? Had they had the indwelling Holy Spirit, had they had that relationship with their God that we have, I don't think they would have fallen in unbelief. But they didn't. All they had was the weak system of law. All right, let's go back and look at a few of them. Now, we had one of your few programs back. But we'll look at it again, too. But as you go back to there, stop at Galatians. Now, these are the scriptural concepts of the system of law. What Israel was so proud of, and their beautiful temple, but oh, it was weak. Galatians chapter 4, honey. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. I think that'll be far enough. Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Now again, what was the problem with the Galatian believers? Well, they were Gentiles but they were being coaxed to go back under certain aspects of the Jewish law. The Judaizers from Jerusalem were not content that these Gentiles could be saved by faith alone, but they had to keep the law, they had to keep temple worship, they had to practice circumcision and all the rest. And so Paul writes this little letter of Galatians just almost beside himself. How could these Galatians come out of such a glorious position in grace and even be tempted to go back under the law? And here's why. Galatians 4, verse 8. How be it then, when you knew not God, they were pagans, remember. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them who by nature are no gods. What's he saying? You were worshiping dead idols wood and stone and silver and gold. They were dead. They couldn't do anything for you. And they had come out of that, see? Now verse 9. But now again, after they had come out of paganism, out of idol worship, they had stepped into the grace of God and Paul's gospel. But now, after you have known God, the true God, by virtue of their saving faith, or rather, he says, you're known of God. Now, I just pointed out to someone again last night. One of the ramifications of our faith today is that God knows us as if we're the only person on earth. Do you feel that way? That's how God feels about you, the believer. It's just as if you were the only one. And we have this confidence that when we pray, we're not just coming up with multitudes of millions of prayers. Well, I wouldn't even bother to pray if I thought that's what it was. But we don't. We come up as an individual. When Christ died, he would have died that death if you would have been the only person living. Now, that's what we call a personal salvation. All right, and so now this is what Paul is saying. How could you, when you came out of paganism, and not only did you know God, but God knows you. What a difference. Now then, he says, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? What were the weak and beggarly elements? The law. That's all it was good for. It was weak and beggarly. It couldn't give men power to live a good life. All it could do is condemn them, as we saw in the first program this afternoon. All right, let's just turn the page while we're in Galatians and go to chapter 5. Verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 1. And he's still on the same premise. Don't go back under the law. Don't embrace any kind of legalism. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ, through his finished work, remember, hath made us free, be not entangled again with the what? 
yoke of bondage. Now, we covered that a few weeks ago, I think, here on the program. What does a yoke always make you think of? To me, a yoke of oxen. Why? Because around their neck they had that piece of wood that was their burden with which they pulled. And that's the whole concept. The law was just like a yoke around an oxen's neck. It burdened him, see? All right, now, even Peter uses the same language, and I think we can go all the way up to Acts 15. I hope that's where it's at. <clears throat> Acts 15. Acts 15. When Peter finally, after a, I think a long day of confrontation, disputation, <clears throat> and he comes to Paul's defense, and he finally gets his own eyes open, and what does he tell us? Verse 9, Acts 15, verse 9. Now this is at the Jerusalem Council, when... Paul has finally confronted the leaders at Jerusalem not to try and put his Gentile believers under the law. And so Peter finally comes to his senses, of course, and he says, verse 9, He put no difference between us, Jews, and them, Gentiles, purifying their, Gentiles, their hearts by faith. Now here it comes, from the lips of Peter. Now therefore, why tempt or test God to put a what? A yoke upon the neck of the disciples. Well, what kind of a yoke is Peter referring to? The oxen. Same thing. Why put your believers under a yoke like oxen pulling a plow? That's what the law did. And so he says, why tempts God and put a yoke upon the neck of these believers? Now, the word disciples, I, I don't like to use it because too many people immediately think of the twelve. No, we're talking about Gentile believers. And he says, that yoke, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. What's Peter admitting? The law never helped them. The law was not a success thing for the nation of Israel. They were constantly under the yoke of it, and it had no power to help them. All right? And so he says, Don't put a yoke upon the neck of those Gentile believers, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Well, all the way through. Uh, let's see. I want to go back to Galatians again. Let's go back to Galatians. There's a verse back there that I think we should look at. All in this concept that the law can do nothing except put us in bondage. All right, Galatians 4, honey. And we'll start with verse 1. <clears throat> because I want you to see how that all through, especially since Paul's revelations have come on the scene, how that we see this constant reference to the law as something that was less than perfect. All right, Galatians 4, verse 1. Now I say <clears throat> that the heir, the child, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. But he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, he's just using this as an, as an example. Even so, we, when we were children, we were in what? Bondage. Under the elements of the world. That was the law. And so you see this constant reference through Scripture that to live under a legalistic system is not freedom, it's not liberty, it's bondage. And that's why Paul comes out then and says, you're not under the law, you're under grace. And oh, what a difference. All right, let's come back to Hebrews once again. Verse 8. Since it was full of faults, since it was a system of bondage, 
since there was no liberty in it. Verse 8, So finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come. Now, well, that was prophecy. That was foretold in the Old Testament, that this thing of the law was a stopgap, only leading up to the coming of Israel's Messiah and the Savior of the world. And so his promise was, The days are coming, saith the Lord, when I will. Now, whenever you see God saying, I will, whether it's back in Abrahamic covenant or any other time, what is it? It's a promise of something future that's coming. And so here he's promising the nation of Israel that the day is coming when they will come out from under this covenant of law and they will go into a new covenant that God is going to make with the house of Israel and the house of Jacob, not according to the covenant that he made with the fathers, speaking again of Moses and Aaron and uh, the tabernacle and so forth in the wilderness. And then drop down to verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. All right, now then, with the minute or two we have left, let's go all the way back to where we have the promise of that new covenant. And that's in Jeremiah chapter 31. And by the way, we are getting the overflow of the promise of this covenant but we are not actually under the covenant. That's waiting for the kingdom. When God will set up his kingdom and believing Israel will become the top dog of the nations and they will enjoy this covenant. Now we've got to look at it quickly. Only have a matter of seconds left. Verse 31 of Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days come. Here's the prophecy. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And this is the covenant. Verse 34, They will teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. When will that happen? When Christ sets up his kingdom. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everyone here in the studio again today. And for those of you joining us out in television, we just want to welcome you to an informal Bible study. And we've always been encouraged that you write back and tell us that for the first time in your life, that's what you are really doing and enjoying, is to open the scriptures and study them on your own. I don't claim to have all the answers, and uh, I certainly don't claim to always be 100% right. But uh, if we can just get people to search the scriptures, then I feel that we've accomplished what the Lord wants us to do. And uh, again, Iris is always reminding me that for the program today, if you write or call, just mention Book 50. And uh, we are in the third set of four programs, and we're in the first program this afternoon. But if you'll just tell us that you want something out of Book 50, why well, it's really easy for the girls to uh, get out what you need. Uh, got an interesting letter the other day. I'm going to have to make reference to it. They're from Canada, and they said the next time you tape, well, you just welcome us sitting there on the back row. 
And uh, so for you folks in Canada, that's what we're doing. We just trust that you feel like you're right here with us. All right, I think that's all the announcements. Again, uh, I guess we should let our audience know we put out a little newsletter quarterly. It's nothing profound. I try to keep it where anybody can read it in 10, 15 minutes and uh, be through with it. But it does uh, keep you aware of where we'll be in our seminar teaching and uh, various stations around the country. So if you need a uh, newsletter, you uh, contact us and we'll get your name on the mailing list. For others of you who may not appreciate getting it and you'd rather not, let us know. And we will gladly take your name off the mailing list. We don't want to waste postage unnecessarily. All right, I think that's all we have to get rolling, and we're going to jump right in where we left off at the end of our last taping, or for those of you who see this weekly, it'll be last week, or someday you'll watch these daily, and then it'll be what you saw yesterday. But whatever, uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 8, and we stopped at verse 9, we're ready to go into 10, but before we go into verse 10, I want to back up, if I may, to... Uh, to verse 7, so we uh, get an understanding of where we left off. Now again, I guess almost every month, at least every fourth program then, or every fifth program, I have to remind my listeners that the book of Hebrews, this letter I think written by the Apostle Paul, is first and foremost directed to Jewish believers, and that's why it's called the Epistle to the Hebrews. Consequently, there is not one word in this whole letter to the Hebrews that is what we would call the body of Christ or the church language. You will find almost nothing that pertains directly to the body of Christ. In other words, you don't see the term, the body of Christ. There is not that emphasis on salvation through faith alone in the death, burial, and resurrection. It's not in here. And there certainly is no reference to pastors and bishops and deacons and elders in Hebrews because, again, it's not directed to the Gentile church. So always be aware of that, that this letter does not address the body of Christ as such. But all the things I trust we've been learning now over these last seven or eight chapters are fundamental truths on which the body of Christ rests. You know, even Romans chapter 3, when Paul says, But now the righteousness of God that has come by our faith in Christ, but it all rests on that which was in the law and in the prophets. So everything is a progressive revelation. And so Hebrews is just another one of those sections of Scripture that even though it's not directly addressed to the Gentile body of Christ, yet it shows us the fundamental truths that were so necessary for our gospel to come about. All right, so now then in chapter 8, starting at verse 7, which we more or less covered in our last half hour, so this is just a quick review, we find that as in all of the book of Hebrews, this is constantly being compared from that which was good, that which in the past, to that which is better, or that which is now. In fact, go back up to verse 6. Maybe back up to verse 6. What's the first two words? But now. In other words, that which was past is past, but now. See, he hath obtained a more excellent ministry. See that constant comparison? And by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. See? Better than that which was before, the old covenant, which was established upon better promises. I love this. Oh, I hope people can see that. Yes, the law was good. Judaism was good as far as it went. But now that has faded off and folded up like an old garment. And uh, now we've got things that are far better. All right, now then jumping in at verse 7. For if... Conditional. For if that first covenant, the covenant of law, if that first covenant had been faultless, if it had been perfect, then there should be no place for a second. That stands to reason, isn't it? I think I mentioned it in the last program. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's only when something is amiss that we dive into it and make corrections. So Paul says, if the first had been perfect, there'd be no need to correct it. But it wasn't. It was fleshly. It was weak. All right, and then verse 8, for finding fault with them. He said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will, future, make a new, better covenant and uh, with the house of Israel. 
and with the house of Judah. Now that's not addressed to the church. The new covenant, even in Jeremiah, we're going to look at it after a bit, was never addressed to the Gentile church. It was addressed to Israel, and we'll look at that. All right, and then verse 9, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, that I made uh, the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Well, we went through that explicitly, back there in chapter 3 especially, when we rehearsed their unbelief at Kadesh Barnea. And what did the Lord say? They entered not because of unbelief. And the warning is, even for us then, don't harden your hearts as they did and stay in unbelief. Rather, keep trusting. All right, then uh, coming on down to now verse 10, where we're going to start with something totally fresh. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. In other words, after all the years, 1,500 at the time Paul writes this, that after all those years, saith the Lord, I will, future tense, put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will, future, be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now, they haven't been that since way, way back in Old Testament history when the Shekinah glory left the temple, you remember? And God even called Daniel and said, Thy people? Why? Because they were no longer God's people. They had turned away in unbelief. But the day is coming when once again they will be the people of God. Let's go back to Jeremiah 31, honey. Go back to Jeremiah 31, and let's see this new covenant in its original setting. Jeremiah 31, and starting with verse 31. And then you'll readily see that this has no direct, indirect, yes, but no direct bearing on the Gentile church. <clears throat> this is a covenant that God has made with Israel, not to be fulfilled, of course, until Christ returns. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come. See, this is a promise for the future. The days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. See how perfectly the Apostle Paul quoted this? Now verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. Well, now let's stop and think for a moment. When God gave the law to Israel, and as we're going to see when we get into chapter 9, and he gave them the tabernacle and the whole sacrificial system of worship. He gave them the priesthood. My, they had everything going for them. God was present, remember, in that pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. And he was present. For 40 years after they had rejected Canaan, he fed them in the wilderness, provided the water, provided everything they needed. And yet, what did the nation of Israel do with it? rejected it. They spurned him for the most part, see? And so, because of their unbelief, this covenant of law became nothing but a broken covenant, waiting for the day when this new one will take uh, center stage. All right? Now verse 33. But, see, there's that flip side again. Oh, they just scorned the first covenant, walked it underfoot. But this shall be the covenant that I will, and again, I'm emphasizing the future tense of these, that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord. In other words, after those days of unbelief and of breaking the original covenant, the Mosaic law, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, not on tables of stone, but he's going to literally implant it in the heart of every Israelite. And then what will happen? I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now I'm going to just read on because there's some good stuff in here. 
and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. Now, you remember back when Moses gave the law, what was the instruction to every Jew? Teach it and teach it. Memorize it. Memorize it. When you get up in the morning, think on the law. When you go to bed at night, you think on the law. And it was just constantly programmed into their thinking. But, you see, when this becomes a reality, which will be, of course, when Christ returns and sets up that glorious kingdom, then Israel won't have to constantly be reminded because it will just be implanted in their very being. All right, and it'll be no longer necessary that they teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least to the greatest, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, I will remember their sin no more. What a promise. What a promise. Now verse 35. For thus saith the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who divides the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. In other words, the God of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's speaking. And now look at the promise in light especially of the Middle East scenario today. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. And I think, uh, no, I'm, I skipped 35 and I shouldn't have. Let's go back up. That's a big, a big boo-boo, isn't it? Verse 35, Thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for a light by day, and he gives the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night. All right, now then, if those things should depart, if the sun would suddenly quit shining, if the stars would suddenly fall out of their position, then it's possible Israel would cease to be a nation, but not until, not until. For 37, for thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured. And what we just hear again in the news this past week, they found another galaxy some billion, trillion years out into space. Well, that's just a magnanimous guess, I know, but nevertheless, what does it tell you? How vast the universe. No human, scientific, anything can measure it. But God says, if they can, then Israel might cease to be a nation, so it'll never happen. Now, I know most of us who are biblically oriented uh, are real concerned about the situation in the Middle East. It almost looks as though the life of the nation of Israel is slowly but surely being snuffed out. And uh, just reading in the Jerusalem Post again last night where a lot of the Jewish people actually think that. Are they about to lose their country? Are they about to be thrown out for the last time? No, they're not. Now, they're going to be squeezed. They're going to go through some terrible times. And uh, the Old Testament prophesies that it's going to come to the place where they will stand totally isolated, all alone, with no one to help them. But they're not going to disappear. And so we can take comfort in that, that the Word of God is steadfast and sure. And uh, they are there. I, I trust they are there as and part of the end time scenario now. And uh, it just tells us that the Lord's coming is getting nearer. You know, uh, I made the big mistake way back in 93. And uh, I thought that by the end of the millennium or by the year 2000, the Lord will return. Well... I didn't set it in concrete, as I say so often, but I shouldn't have even said that much because we, we can't even speculate. So you remember I told you the cartoon that I had seen about the same time the old boy sitting outside his cave door and above he had, had written, the end is near, but then he had second thoughts and he added ER. Remember that? The end is nearer. <laughs> And so that's the way I leave it today. Yes, the end is nearer than it was yesterday. And it's certainly a lot nearer than it was when Israel first declared themselves an independent state in 1948. But we can see that all the ramifications of the world, 
the turmoil, the perplexity, the wars. Somebody t called me on the, other, on the phone the other day, and again, I have to respect uh, what people tell me, and uh, I didn't ask for a documentary of it. But he had heard someone give a lecture that right now today there are 50 wars raging around the planet. 50. Well, I knew it was well over 40, the last I read in one of the news magazines, but just think about it. 50 wars are raging. 48 of them involve the Muslim people. And so we, we find ourselves in, in a world that's in turmoil, and it's not just politics, it's just not economics, it's religious. And if you go back into history, you'll find that most of the turmoil all the way back was usually, not always, but usually based on religious differences. But the nation of Israel, in spite of all the pressure, in spite of all the gloom, will never again cease to be a nation. So let me finish verse 37. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured, the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off the seed of Israel for all that they have done. But it's not going to happen because this new covenant is a covenant sent from the eternal sovereign God and he will never go back on his word. All right, let's come back a minute then to Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 8. And then we'll go on to verse 11. I'd like to finish this chapter 8 in this half hour. And now as we go into chapter 11, 11 they, it's coming back to Jeremiah 31, 31, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Now here again, you see, you and I in the human realm cannot comprehend the grace of God, even concerning Israel. My God should have cast them out of his thinking centuries and centuries ago. They have no reason to still be in God's favor. <clears throat> they have been a rebellious people. They've been an ungodly people. In fact, let me take you back another verse. Go all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And it, it just shows the mind of a merciful God. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. And God has never changed. He has never even had a thought of casting away his people Israel. Even as Paul says in Romans 11, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Don't even think such a thing. That even though they had rejected him and crucified him, yet God has not cast away his people Israel. All right, and the promise begins way back here in 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verse 14, where God is addressing King David. And he tells David, that concerning the nation of Israel, I will be his father. He shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men. In other words, in another place, Isaiah I think speaks of people coming in with a language that the Jews couldn't understand. In other words, they'd be overrun by their Gentile enemies. But that's not going to stop God. He said, I will chasten him with the rod of God, with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. Now verse 15. But, but even though they're iniquitous, even though they are steeped in unbelief, yet God says, My mercy shall not depart away from him. Now, let me take you back to another, and I hope I can find it in Exodus. All the way back to Exodus. I think it's in chapter 33. Exodus 33, drop down to verse 19, honey. Exodus 33, dropping down to verse 19. And don't forget these things. These, these are the very words of the eternal God. And nothing that men or nations or governments can ever change. It's set in concrete, as I like to so often express it. Exodus 33, verse 19. 
And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, that is, before Moses. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. Now look at it. Here comes the promise. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now, if you remember when we were teaching in Romans several years ago, I use the analogy, it's just like someone who has stepped out in the bright sunlight and these things just come down upon him, but God retreated and he retreated into his sovereignty. Even though men may have just exclaimed, no way, but God retreats into his sovereignty. He is absolute. And in his sovereignty, what does he say? I will show mercy to whom I'll show mercy. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Nobody can change that. He's sovereign. And even though you and I as mortals cannot understand some of these things, yet we have to remember that in his sovereignty, God can do whatever he wants to do, even though we may sometimes think it's ridiculous. And from the human, maybe it is. But all from his sovereignty, never. All right, back to Hebrews again. Chapter 8, and now in verse 12, with what we've just been seeing from the Old Testament. For God says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Even though they've been a wicked and an ungodly nation. If you think I'm stretching the point, you haven't read the Old Testament lately. You go back to the Old Testament and you wonder how God ever put up with it. And never forget, the vast majority then, as now, even though they were religious, they didn't have saving faith. And I'm always going back to Elijah when he confronted the prophets of Baal. That's probably the clearest explanation of the spiritual level of Israel. And here most of Israel had fallen down and worshipped Jezebel's god, Baal. And you know the story. And when Elijah confronted him, and the fire from heaven lapped up all the water that Elijah had put on his sacrifices, and God instructed him to kill the prophets of Baal, and he did. But then when the message got to old Jezebel, just about 20 miles to the east in Jezreel, she sent the messenger right back. You tell Elijah that tomorrow at this time, he'll be as dead as my priests of Baal are. And poor old Elijah did what? He ran, and he ran, and he ran. And I always like to make it graphic. He was more than a marathon runner. He was triple that. And he ran all the way to the Negev. Now, that's a good hundred miles. And then he gets down under a Jupiter tree, and I imagine he's all pooped out, scared to death. And what did he say? Lord, take my life. I'm the last one left in Israel. Take me and forget about the nation. And what was God's answer? Elijah, 7,000. 7,000 have not bowed their knee to Baal. And we think, well, that's a pretty good chunk of people. 7,000? But listen, out of an average population of 7 million, and you've heard me say this a hundred times, at least in my classes, 7,000 out of 7 million is one-tenth of one percent. Even in Israel. That's all that were remaining true to Jehovah. Well, it's never been much different. At the time of the flood, it was less than that. That was just eight. And I feel there were four billion people on the earth at the time of the flood. Eight people. That's all. And now another graphic illustration. It's not quite as, as clear, but I think it's pretty close. And when you get into Acts chapter 1, after the Lord has been ministering to Israel up and down the dusty roads of the little nation, and they come together in the upper room, how many were there? Come on, you all know. 120. 120. Now, I have to feel that that was most, if not all, of the true believers in Israel concerning Christ. 120. After three years of his miracles and his ministry. Well, then we wonder why people don't listen to me or you. It's always been that way. We can never expect the multitudes. I don't. That's why I'm tickled to death if people call and say, well, we're going to get 20 people together. Will you come? Sure, I'll go. Because I'd rather have 20 true believers and who are really concerned as to have a whole stadium full that want to be entertained. 
But you see, it's always been that way. God has always had to settle for that tiny little remnant. All right, now in the couple minutes we have left, uh, verse 12 and 13. For God says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and their iniquities. I will remember no more. Now stop and think. Can you and I forget something that has happened in the past? Not very likely. Not if it's made an imprint on us. We can try our best, but you cannot forget it. It's there. And as you go through life, something will just trigger it, and there it's back. But what about God? He can't. See, God can forget. And that's the precious promise, that when He forgives, He forgets. He doesn't throw up our past. Our old memory will, but God won't. And always remember that, that God doesn't hold, I don't care how black the past, God doesn't hold that against it. He has forgotten it. Well, he did the same thing with Israel. And so then verse 13, in the few seconds that are left, in that he saith, a new covenant. He hath made the first old, like a garment, that's ready to be folded up and cast aside. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Well, what's he still trying to impress upon these Jewish people? That the old system of law and the old religion of Judaism is now worn out. It's past. It's done. And they're to look for something totally new. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felding, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felding. Okay, good to see everybody in here again, and... Uh crowd this big. It takes a while for everybody to get a cup of coffee, doesn't it? But uh, we're glad you're here. And uh, again, I know some of you have come from a distance. Some of you are here for the first time today. We'd like to welcome you. And then for those of you joining us on television, again, we always like to just say thanks for joining us and uh, thanks for your letters, your prayers, your support. And uh, as we said in our last newsletter, nothing thrills us more than to have people say that their lives have been changed. Well, that's what the Word of God is supposed to do. And uh, whenever someone asks or calls or writes and says, how can I know that I'm saved? The first thing I ask them, well, has your lifestyle changed? Because uh, you, can't, uh, you can't make a profession of salvation and uh, keep on living like you always lived before. So uh, again, I'd just like to remind our television folks, in case someone is listening for the first time, we're just a plain, simple Bible teaching. And uh, I've tried to just keep it non-denominational without attacking anybody and without currying favor with anybody. We just want to get folks into the Word. And uh, now again, I think we'll just jump right in where we left off. And that would be in chapter 10. And... Uh, Verse 29, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. And again, always remembering, as I've tried to stress over and over since we started Hebrews, that this book, of course, is addressed primarily to Jewish believers. I think probably within one synagogue congregation, whereas you see Peter is going to write to the 12 tribes scattered, Whereas this letter, I feel, is addressed to one local church. I don't think it's the Jerusalem church, but uh, it was evidently a congregation of some decent size. And the whole problem was that some of them, probably not many, 
But some, after experiencing this tremendous salvation based on the finished work of the cross, were being drawn back into Judaism and the sacrificial system of temple worship. Now, you want to remember, the temple is still going. When all of our New Testament is written, except maybe the book of Revelation and even that, I prefer to think it was written in the 60s as well. But uh, you all know that all of Paul's letters and all the Gospels and the little epistles following Hebrews were all written before 70 A.D. when the temple is destroyed. And you remember I made the point, I think, on the program a couple months ago. Isn't it amazing? how that God forbid any empire to destroy Jerusalem and the temple and the nation of Israel until Paul's letters were completed. And within a couple of years after the completion of Paul's epistles, and the temple is now moot, a word that someone just reminded I said oh, quite often, I said, well, it's such an appropriate word. And they even looked it up in the dictionary. You know what it means, don't you? What does it mean that it's moot? Well, it's of no count. <laughs> it doesn't count, so why worry about it? Well, you see, as soon as Paul's letters were finished, then temple worship had become moot. And uh, what does God permit? Titus to destroy it and the city. And uh, I think it all fits in and just screams at us that these people should have been able to see that all the Old Testament promises had been fulfilled in Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension back to glory. That was all prophesied, and uh, yet they never saw that. And so always remember that even though the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish people who were fighting this, this traumatic experience of being pulled back into their old re uh, religious system, yet it is full. It is just full of knowledge for you and I as believers. I remember I said when we started the book of Hebrews, there's no plan of salvation in the book of Hebrews. You can't take someone to the Hebrews and lead them to the Lord. You, you, you just can't do it. Not like the Roman road or Ephesians or something like that. But it is so full of basic information that enhances our own faith. All right, now let's get on. Hebrews chapter 10. And so verse 29 of how much sore punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing or a common thing, I think is a better word, and has done desperate on the Spirit of grace. Now we got to remember that in our last program in the closing moments we were looking at those previous verses of someone who willfully turned back and went into the religion of Judaism with its animal sacrifices. And then the verse that we closed with in the last program, how that the law, the Mosaic law, was severe. There was no mercy. If someone was caught even picking up sticks on the Sabbath day, what was the punishment? Death. Now, that's severe. My, we would never stand for something like that today, would we? But that's the way the law was. It was so severe. And when the law was severe and they rejected it, then there was no doubt that God's wrath would be placed upon them into their eternal doom. All right, if a religious system like Judaism prompted the wrath of God, then you see how much more, see, how much sorer punishment, how much more God's wrath can be poured out on those who have walked underfoot the blood of Christ. Now, you've heard me emphasize this over the years. Why? Why can God consign lost humanity to such an awful eternal doom? Because he's done everything he could for them to prevent it. He's done everything they needed to escape that eternal doom without lifting a finger, by just simply believing what he had done. And when they walk that underfoot and they scorn it, then God is perfectly just in consigning them to that kind of a punishment. So don't ever listen to those kind of arguments. Well, how can a just God send somebody to a lake of fire? Well, he's got every reason in the world to, because he's already done everything to keep them from it. All right, so how much sore punishment? Suppose you shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot. Now, don't lose the picture. They have literally walked underfoot in scorn 
the blood of the covenant, that is, his sacrificial blood of the cross, and wherewith he was sanctified, and they've considered it a common thing. I think that's a better word than unholy. They've considered it something common. No more different than the sand and the gravel that they walked on. And they're going to suffer for it. All right, now verse 30. For we know him that hath said. Now, of course we do. As believers, we know the God of glory. We know this Savior of mankind on a personal basis. And so we can agree with Paul when he says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. He's God. He's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. He doesn't have to save anybody. But he chose to save some, as Paul puts it in Romans. All right. And so vengeance belongeth unto me, and God says, I will recompense. He is going to pour out his wrath on those who have rejected his offer of salvation. And then again, the Lord shall judge his people. Now, let me show you a comparison. Now, a lot of people don't realize that the lake of fire is evidently going to have levels of punishment. Come back with me to Matthew chapter 11. Chapter 10 and 11, there are two of them. Let's look at chapter 10 first. Because you have to understand that when I maintain that good people, church members, choir singers, deacons, yes, a lot of pastors, are going to miss heaven, even though they've been good. Well, now, are they going to suffer the same level of the lake of fire as a murderer? No. No, there's going to be levels of punishment. Now, they're still going to miss glory, but they are not going to suffer to the extent that some wicked individual. All right, now here's my reasoning. Matthew chapter 10, and drop in at verse 15. Now these are the words of the Lord himself during his earthly ministry. <coughs> Got it? Matthew 10, 15. Verily Jesus said, I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable, or the punishment is going to be less severe. For the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, those wicked Sodomites, are going to have an easier time of it in the eternal doom than for these Jews who listen to Christ's earthly ministry. So it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment, that's the great white throne of Revelation 20, than for that city. Behold, he says, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Well, who were the wolves? The Jews of Jesus' day who would not respond to his ministry. All right, turn the page, at least my Bible, to chapter 11, verse 20. Same kind of a concept. Again, the Lord is speaking in his earthly ministry. Verse 20. Then he began to upbraid the cities, wherein most of his mighty works were done, his miracles, because they repented not. In other words, their miracles never even phased their unbelief. They continued to scorn and reject Jesus of Nazareth. All right? So he says, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! Now those were beautiful cities up in the Galilee. For if, see, conditional, if the mighty works which were done in you, that is, his miracles, feeding the 5,000 and raising the dead at times and healing the sick, if those kind of miracles had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which were wicked Gentile cities on the Mediterranean sea coast, they were primarily Roman, and that's why they're referred to as Gentile cities. But Jesus said, had he performed the kind of miracles in those Gentile cities that he did in these Jewish cities of Galilee, what would Tyre and Sidon have done? They would have repented in sackcloth and ashes, see? Now verse 22, but Jesus said, I say unto you, it shall be more 
tolerable. It'll go easier. On the cities of Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. It's tough, isn't it? That's tough language. All right, now next verse. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven. Now, those of you who have been there with us or with other groups, I don't think anybody goes to Israel and not visit Capernaum. And even in its ruins, it's beautiful. And all you got to do is just close your eyes and imagine what a beautiful city that must have been on the north shore of the Galilee at the time of Christ. And they knew it. They were a puffed-up city because of all that they had going for them. So he says, And thou, Capernaum, who art exalted unto heaven, because they were such a beautiful city, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in you had been done in even Sodom, Sodom would have remained to this day. In other words, had Christ performed the kind of miracles in Sodom and Gomorrah and preached the message that he preached in Israel, Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented and cleaned up their act. But Capernaum wouldn't. You see the difference? All right, now it's the same way back here. When people are confronted with this glorious gospel of grace, and they can enter into salvation by faith and faith alone, and then they spurn it and walk it underfoot. Can anybody blame God for casting his wrath upon them? Of course not. And the scripture makes it so plain. All right. Verse 31. As a warning then, as a warning to people then as well as today, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, four times in the book of Hebrews, you've had the term, the living God. Twice as it appears for us as believers, he is our living God. But twice as it applies to the unbeliever, who also are going to have to do with the living God, who is alive forevermore. All right, when the lost come up before him, and he pronounces their final doom. There is no word of argument because he is the living God. He's not some idol made with stone and wood. He is the living creator of the whole universe, and he's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. In fact, let's just go back and look what Paul is alluding to. Revelation chapter 20. Not many people will even refer to it anymore, but I'm still not afraid to. And, uh, you know, the day may come when they'll force me off television. Well, that's okay. We've had 12 years already, and we've accomplished what I feel the Lord has wanted us to do so far. But uh, we're not going to shirk from showing people what the Bible says. Revelation 20, starting in verse 11. And this is exactly what we're referring to, that the lost, whether they are good people or whether they're the down and out gutter of the world. Makes no difference. They're all going to come before the great white throne. Verse 11 <clears throat> of Revelation 20. And I saw a great white throne. And him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Now you want to remember, this is in that time interval between the end of the kingdom, the thousand year reign, and the onset of eternity. And I think Peter makes it so plain that when the kingdom is completed, this whole universe is just going to disappear in a puff of smoke, and there will out of it come then for eternity a new heaven and a new earth. Now, not everybody's going to agree with me, but I think the language is such that it can't be otherwise. And I think the reason is that Satan has defiled everything God ever made. Out to the edges of space, Satan has defiled everything. And so consequently, I feel it will all be melted down, as Peter says. All right? So in this time frame now between the end of the kingdom and the onset of eternity, we're going to have the great white throne, what God has done with all the believers in the meantime. You leave that up to God. He's not going to lose any of us. 
and we're going to be someplace in utter safety, and we're not going to be at this great white throne. This is only for the lost from Cain until the end. All right, now then, verse 12. And John saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Now, God, of course, here will be Jesus Christ. And the books, the books, plural, were opened. And another book, singular, is opened. And that's the book of life. The dead, the lost now, ready to hear their doom. The first thing they will be shown are the blanks in that book of life where their name could have been, but it's not there. And so they can't argue. Well, I did this and I did that. No, your name is not in the Lamb's book of life. Then he turns to the books, plural, which is the record of their daily activities as they were on earth, all right? And so they were judged, that is, their level of punishment now is judged out of those things which were written in the books, the plural, according to their works. Now, I think I've mentioned this before. For years, I used to wonder, even God in his omnipotence, is he going to keep track of every individual's daily life? Yeah. And now with our technology, and they can put the whole King James Bible on a chip the size of a pinhead, well, if man can do that, then God can keep a record of a few billion people. No problem. And so he'll check the record, and he'll probably show it to them. Here's your life. Who are you to say that you can come into my heaven? Your name is not in the Lamb's Book of Life. Your life has shown nothing that smacks of a believer. And then they'll have to admit their doom is justified. All right, then you come down to verse 14. Well, verse 13, the sea and the dead were in it, the death and hell delivered up dead which were in them, and they were judged, see? Their level of punishment was determined according to their works. Not everybody's going to suffer the same. There's going to be degrees, see? All right, then the next verse, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. And death is separation. The first separation was soul and spirit from the body. The second death is the separation of the lost from God. Horrible, awful thought. But it's scriptural, and people need to be warned. All right, back to Hebrews 10. So indeed, verse 31 is not stretching the envelope one bit. It is a fearful thing as an unbeliever. It's a fearful thing for an unbeliever to fall into the hands of the living God. But for us, nothing better could happen. We are in his care. We're in the hollow of his hand. We are hid in God, in Christ. We have nothing to fear. But the lost, oh my goodness, I don't see how they can go to bed at night. All right, now then, verse 32. But... After realizing what an awful thing it is to fall into the hands of the living God as a lost person, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were, your you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. All right, remember what I said in the last program? When cult people tried to come out of that cult, what happened? All the pressure that family can put on them, all the pressure that their organization can put on them, all the pressure and the threats and everything, and it just draws them back. And it's almost, without the power of God, impossible to come back. Well, Judaism had the same kind of a pull. That big, beautiful temple complex and with all the activities surrounding it, the feast days, and uh, boy, it, it was something to behold. And then to turn their back on all that and step into a life of separation, it wasn't easy. Now, the next verse tells you how much harder it was even than we would think, because partly while you were made a gazing stock by both reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became compassionate,
companions of them that were so used. Now, what's he talking about? That as soon as they made their break with Judaism, what did all their Jewish friends begin to do? Castigate them, disown them. They still do to a degree. Now, if you've ever read the account of Jewish converts, not always, but many times the family will disown them. Some instances they'll actually hold a funeral for them, treat them as if they're dead. And then, of course, back in the, in the first century, you still had the persecuting power of, of the Romans. But there were a lot of In fact, let's go back. I think we've got a few minutes. Let's go back to Acts. Let's go back to Acts. As Paul is making his first sojourn out amongst the Gentiles, and he would always begin, of course, in the synagogue of the Jews, and uh, consequently, of course, there were quite a few Jews in those early days of Paul's ministry. And uh, let's see if I can find the chapter that I think makes it so plain. And that would be in uh, chapter 17 of Acts. <coughs> Acts chapter 17. And here Paul has just begun from northern Greece. He's been up at Philippi. And, of course, you know what happened there. He ended up in the dungeon. But uh, he keeps on proclaiming the gospel of grace, and he always starts in the synagogue of the Jews. All right, let's just start in chapter 17, verse 1. Because this is exactly now what this verse in Hebrews is referring to, how that when these Jews believed, the rest of the Jewish community came down on them hard. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a what? synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and for three Sabbath days, or for three weeks, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Now, you know, I'm always having to qualify. How much Scripture has been written by the time Paul is on his missionary journeys? Only the Old Testament, nothing of the New. So whenever you speak of the Scriptures, until Paul's epistles start coming out, it's Old Testament. They had no New Testament. All right, and so he reasoned with them out of the Old Testament Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, risen again from the dead, and this Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, whom I preach unto you, is the Christ, the Messiah. Some what? Believe. Some of the Jews believe. And, of course, consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, that is, of the city of, of uh, Thessalonica, not a few. But now verse 5. But as soon as the Jewish community at the synagogues saw that some had become believers and would be turning their back on Judaism, the Jews who believed not were moved with envy, and they took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser soot sort and gathered a company and set all the city on an, uproar, on an uproar and sought to bring them out to the people. Verse 6, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These who have turned the world upside down are come hither also. What are they doing? They're screaming to have them arrested. See? All right. So verse 8, they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security, Jason and the others, they let them go. Well, anyway, this is just a brief picture that wherever Paul began his ministry, he would always start in the synagogue of the Jews because at least he had people who knew of a, of a one God. They knew of the Old Testament scriptures, and it was the logical place to start. And some of them would believe, but the most of them would reject it and then he would turn to the Gentiles. But for these believing Jews who had turned their back on Judaism, do you see what they were under? They were under the pressure of their fellow Jews and consequently suffered inexorably for their newfound faith. All right, just for a second, we've got left. In fact, I guess we almost have to wind it up. Back to Hebrews chapter 10 and uh, verse 33. For these Jews who had solidly embraced Paul's gospel and had turned away from the sacrifices of Judaism. They were made gazing stock by reproach and afflictions 
And while you became companions of them, they're so used, for you had compassion on me, Paul says. Where? In my bonds, when he was in prison. Now listen, to become a believer throughout most of Christendom was a tough <coughs> row to hope. <laughs> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felder. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldman. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldman. Okay, it's good to see everybody back in here again, and uh, for those of you joining us on television, once again, we just cherish your letters, your phone calls, your, your financial help, everything, because, uh, you know, we're just ordinary cattle ranchers. Uh, we don't have a lot of millions behind us. I think a lot of people may think that because we're ranching in Oklahoma, we got oil wells on every 40 acres. Well, that's not the case. <laughs> uh, we just ranch on a pile of mountains and rocks, but uh, anyhow, the Lord has provided all our needs. Every month, it's the same old story. Are we going to get our bills paid? But we seem to. So we, uh, we just give the Lord the credit for using us in what little way he has. Okay, now let's get right back into Bible study because that's what this is all about, is just comparing Scripture with Scripture and uh, tying it all together. Now in Hebrews chapter 10, picking up from our last program, where he says in verse 34 that these Hebrew believers, you had compassion of me in my bonds, which means that this must have been somewhere in the early 60s, whether it was referring to Paul's first imprisonment in Rome, or whether it in another case where he was in prison, such as at Caesarea or whatever, we certainly know that Paul was imprisoned more than those uh, years in Rome. But whatever, these people were aware of his being imprisoned, and they had compassion on him, and uh, they took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. In other words, they helped him financially, even though most of them had not that kind of money. And uh, out of their love for the apostles, he said, you could became companions of them that were so used. Uh, I'm sorry, for in verse 34, that you have in heaven a better and an enduring something. You know what he's saying? Just because they gave of the meager things they had of this world, they were still what? Richer for it. And so I think a lot of times we have to realize today that uh, people are reluctant to give because they've got so much to spend it on. In fact, Iris and I were talking on it driving up again this morning of all the fads and gadgets that are thrown at especially America, I think all the Western world, all these gadgets and fans, fads that come along and some people in their weakness think they have to have every last one of them. No, we don't. You don't need it all because most of it just ends up in a closet someplace and uh, probably used only once or twice. But how much better if they would spend some of that to promote the Word of God. And that's what Paul is saying here, see, that you took the spoiling or the cashing in of your goods, your material things, and they knew within themselves that eternity had something far better. In fact, it goes right back to how did the Lord put it? Don't lay up treasures on this earth where moth and rust do corrupt, but what? Lay it up in heaven. And uh, as some have said, send it on ahead. <laughs> I think that's a good way of putting it. Send it on ahead because it's drawn far better interest up there than it will down here. 
All right. Then verse 35, so cast not away therefore your confidence with has great recompense of what? Reward. Now we were just talking at break time a little bit. You see, the lost people have nothing to look forward to but the reading of their works which will determine their level of punishment in their eternal doom. But for you and I as believers, as well as these Hebrew believers, it's not a matter of a degree of punishment. It's not even a matter of a degree of how high we're going to be in God's program, but it's going to be what? Reward. And I don't know what those rewards are going to be, but I know that my God knows how to do absolutely fair and just. And so, yes, we are laboring as believers, not for salvation, but for reward. Maybe we better go back and look at it. First Corinthians. See, this is why I don't get through, honey. I told her last night, maybe I can finish Hebrews. Well, no, but I get up here and I think of all these other things and uh, we're not going to rush Hebrews and skip all this good stuff. But come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul is dealing with the reward system for the believer. Not the punishment level for the unbeliever, but the reward system for the believer. Big difference. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we almost have to start at verse 9 to pick up the flow. Where he writes, we are laborers together as believers, not for salvation. That comes by faith and faith alone. But as soon as we become a believer, God is going to give us opportunity for service, for working. And we're not going to do that without reward. So he says, we're laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. See? He's in control. You are God's building. He's the one that is putting it all together. Now verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, Paul writes, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Now do you see why I emphasize Paul? If you were to show me a beautiful new home, you know one of the first things I would ask you? Who was your contractor? Who built it? And if everything went as it should be, what would you do? You'd be glad to tell me who it was, what a great job he did. And you know what I would ask you? When did you bring your contractor on the scene? When you had the first floor finished? No, I'd like to see head shake. No, of course not. When did your contractor begin the work on your new home? When he set the stakes. He dug the foundation. He started from bottom up. Well, see, that's what the Apostle Paul is claiming. He's not the foundation. He's the one who laid the foundation. See the big difference? And so Paul says, as a wise master builder, the contractor, I laid the foundation. Not Peter, James, and John. Not even Jesus. They were just reading another one the other night. Jesus didn't start anything. How true. He didn't start the church. He became the basis of the church, but he didn't start it. Paul did. And so Paul takes by the Holy Spirit's inspiration full credit. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth. Here comes the work system. We're saved by that foundation which is Jesus Christ and his finished work of the cross. But now we're building on that, see, as believers. Then verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, already done. And Paul don't take credit for being the foundation. Who is? Jesus Christ. Now, again, you can go back into the secular world. You can go back into Scripture. I don't know whether it was a parable or not, but you remember Jesus used the analogy of building on the sand? How long will it last? Till the first good rainstorm. There it goes. But if you want that building to last, you're going to build it on what? A solid foundation. That was what he was teaching. Well, Paul is saying the same thing. We're not building on the sands of some false religion. We're building on the foundation of the one and only true God, 
given basis for salvation. And that is that work of the cross, all right? So then verse 12, now Paul says, as a believer, you've been saved through the foundational work of the cross. Now as a believer, you're going to start building on that foundation for reward. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, six materials, three of them will never burn up. Three of them would go in a puff of smoke like a western forest fire. Just gone. Why? Because they were good for nothing. Just a waste of time. And how many Christians aren't going to find out that that's what has happened? But those three that will abide, gold, silver, precious stone, no fire can destroy it. If anything, it will enhance it. And so Paul is using the analogy. Every man, verse 13, every man. Now, that's a generic term, remember. When Paul says man, he's not leaving the women out. Every believer's work, work as a believer, shall be made manifest. And what's the explanation I'll use for manifest? Put in the spotlight. Put in the spotlight, just like turning on the microscope and put the slide over the light, and there's everything manifested. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen to our works. They're going to be manifested. They're going to be put in the spotlight. All right? The day, the judgment day, not the great white throne judgment. That's for the unbelievers. The Bema seat judgment, 2 Corinthians 5, we shall all appear where? Before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. I think it's unfortunate that the translators use that word judgment. That scares people. They think the believers are going to come up and almost going to have a whip laid over them. No, 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 no. When we believers come before the Lord, it's going to be the Bema seat, the place of reward. And I've always likened it to the Olympic races. My, as those athletes ran back past the finish line, who determined who was first? Who determined who was second and third and so forth? The Bema seat judges. And that's what Paul refers to. That when we become, when we come before the Bema seat for reward, then the fiery eyes of the Lord Jesus, which I get from Revelation 19, where he's going to have eyes as flame of fire, those fiery eyes of the Lord Jesus will test our works, and the fire shall test every man's work of what sort it is. Now remember the analogy. Is it gold, silver, and precious stones, or is it wood, hay, and stubble? The day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall test every man's work of what it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, in other words, as a believer, and if it's gold, silver, and precious stone, it'll remain, and you receive what? Reward. Now, we don't know what they're going to be. We can speculate all you want, but I cannot tell someone, well, this verse says this is what we're going to have. We can't do that. All I know is that God is fair, He's just, and His reward is going to be beyond human comprehension, whatever it is. But now the other side of the coin is, verse 15, if any man's work, as a believer, now we're talking about believers, and even believers, are going to come before the Bema seat with nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. They've never done anything worth a plug nickel. But they're believers, all right? And so their work shall be burned. Now, that's not talking about hellfire burning. It's just simply a point of that it's going to be set aside like trees that are pruned and the branches are burned, all right? Burned, he will suffer loss. Not of salvation, but of what? Reward. That's all. He'll suffer loss of reward. You remember way back when I was teaching this? It was about the time that, uh, I don't remember what the commercial was. I don't watch that much television. I don't watch any anymore. But uh, at that time, there was a commercial with the baseball player, Bob Yoker. You remember that? And he was sitting clear. Yeah, some of you baseball fans, you remember that. Oh, Bob Yoker was sitting clear up in the upper reaches of the stadium all by himself. And it was a funny commercial, and I don't know what the point was. But my point was 
these believers that are going to end up without reward, they're going to be there, but they're going to be up in the yucker seats. <laughs> they're going to be up there where there's no activity. There's nothing like being on the playing field. See what I'm driving at? But they're going to be in glory. I'll never forget a man that I witnessed to over and over back many, many, many years ago. And then he used to always come back with the same argument. He says, Les, he said, all I care about is that I can just slip under the door. I said, but you're not going to slip under the door. You either come full force in salvation or you're going to miss it. But that was always his excuse. If I can just slip in under the door. Not a lot of people had the same idea. But here we have the picture. The believer who has produced and has been in the right attitude and his motivation has been to please the Lord, it's going to be gold, silver, and precious stone. If all he's done it for is earthly acclaim or the pat on the back of fellow human beings, it's wood, hay, and stubble. It'll count for nothing. And so we are to labor for reward. Let me finish verse 15 so I make the point. If any man's work shall be burned, in other words, he has nothing but wood, hay, and stubble, he'll suffer loss, he'll not get reward, but he himself shall be saved. He's going to be in glory, yet so as by fire. In other words, it will be by the skin of his teeth, if I may put it that way. All right, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 10. And so you have the same concept that these Jewish believers who were suffering for their faith would experience one day reward. All right, verse 35 is where we came from. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. See? For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Now, of course, to a Jew, the promises were everything, I guess, from Abraham on up through the Old Testament and flowing on into Christ's kingdom reign. And here it is in verse 37. For yet a little while, a little while, and he that shall come, what? Shall come. Now, Paul expected it in his lifetime. And he didn't have any idea that it was going to go 2,000 years. But here we are now, almost 2,000 years after the fact. And what can I stand here and say? He that is coming will come. Don't you ever doubt it for a minute. Let the scornful scoff all they want. In fact, I can show you a verse, if that isn't exactly what we're seeing today. Come back a few pages in your New Testament to Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 3. 2 Peter, chapter 3. All got it? 2 Peter, chapter 3. Drop down to... Verse 3. Second Peter, chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 3. Knowing. See, that's what I like about Scripture. There are things that we're supposed to know, not guess or hope so. Peter says, no. This first, that there shall come in the last days. Now, remember, when Peter wrote of the last days, what was he talking about? Within the next 10 years. Within the next 10 years. Now I say 10 because they knew there was a seven-year tribulation in there. So within 10 years, they expected all of this to be consummated. That in the last days shall come scoffers walking after their own lusts or desires. They're of the world. They're fleshly. Now this is what the scoffers will say. Does it ring a bell? Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, now remember, who are we dealing with here? Jews. So who were the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the prophets, see? And so these Jews of Peter's day and Paul's day are saying the same thing. Why ever since the fathers they've been talking about the Lord's coming? 
And they had. Every Jew that had any knowledge of the Old Testament was looking for the Messiah. Jews today that have any knowledge of their scriptures are looking for the Messiah. All right, so this is what the scoffer said then. Why, you've been talking about the Lord coming, the Messiah coming ever since Abraham. But all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Isn't that exactly what people are saying today? Well, I read articles almost an average of once a week where some writer, some editorial writer who scoffs at our idea of apocalyptic judgments and so forth, and, and they just scorn it. Hey, they, they've been talking about this for centuries. Nothing's different ever happened. The world's going to keep going. This isn't just the end. Well, I've got news for them. This is the beginning of the end. We're seeing it. And, uh, but with God, of course, wheels grind slowly. All right, so come back to Hebrews 10 again. Verse 37, repeating it. For yet a little while. Paul thought it'd be in his lifetime. But yet a little while. And he that shall come will come. Don't ever doubt it. He is coming again. And he will not tarry. When it's time for him to come, nothing is going to prevent it. Now verse 38. Again, you know, I always say that Paul shifts gears. <laughs> just all of a sudden, he just shifts from one gear down to the next. All right, now here we have a shift. Now the just, the believers, shall live by what? Faith. Now, just because he's writing to Jews doesn't change it one iota. Because he says the same thing back in Romans and Galatians. See? That the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draw back and they do not embrace these things by faith, then God says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Because God, as we're going to see when we get into chapter 11, looks first and foremost for only one human attribute. And it's not goodness, it's not kindness, it's not love. What's the first thing he looks for? Faith. And when you got faith, all of the other things fall in place. But faith has to come first. All right? So the just shall live by faith. But if any draw back from that faith then God has no pleasure in him. All right, verse 39, but Paul writes, we are not of them who draw back under perdition. We're not turning our back scornfully and going back into a religious system that will make them miss heaven's glory. But, he says, we're of them that, what? Believe. Now, all the way up through Paul's epistles, that's been, the, that's been the precise instruction for a right relationship with God, is to believe what he has said. And the synonymous word, of course, is faith, see? So, to them who believe to the saving of the soul. Well, now I think we can just slip right into chapter 11 because I'm amazed that the chapters aren't up there a couple verses. But here we have it now that this whole system of believing or faith, now verse 1 of chapter 11, is the substance of things hoped for. Now imagine in as many people we have in this room, you all have a different idea of substance, don't you? You know what I think of when I think of substance? I think of the core of something that holds it all together. In other words, just picture a wheel, just a simple wheel. What is the substance of that wheel? The hub. The hub. Because the hub is that which goes out to all the rest of that wheel. You take away the hub and you've got nothing. And that's substance. Now, I suppose you could take it onto almost any other area of life. What is substance? That which counts. See? All right? So, faith is the substance. It's the core. 
of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things what? Not seen. Not seen. So how do we know they're for real? Faith. God said it. God said it. And we know it's true. All right? Verse 2, for by it, by faith, and we're going to see that in our next program, that by faith the elders, the Old Testament patriarchs, obtained a good report. Now verse 3, through faith, by taking God at his word, we as believers understand that the worlds, the universe, were framed by what? The Word of God. He didn't have to go into his chemistry workshop and put some things together and then throw it out. All he had to do was speak the Word, and out of nothing, the universe began to appear. And I don't think the whole universe exploded at one time. I think the universe has been exploding and going out and going out and going out over the period of time, but whatever, it was done by the spoken word, and all of Scripture substantiates that. So that things which are seen, our universe, everything around us on this planet, everything that are seen were not made of things which do appear. I see the scientists can't accept that, can he? He just has a hard time with it. And so they spend billions and billions of dollars trying to figure out the origin of the universe. And if they found out, what good would it do? <laughs> Nothing. It's not going to change anything. Not one whit. You know, I've even told geologists, you go through all the conflict of geology and everything that you've learned, is that going to change where the oil is? Well, of course not. That's not going to change one iota. And so we have to accept the fact that when God spoke the word, the universe came into being. And I don't care when it was. I don't care if it was 6,000 years ago or 6 billion years ago. It makes no difference. Again, I'll use my word. It's moot. <laughs> what difference does it make? And so all Paul says that we as believers, this we know, that the universe was framed by the word of God. And the God who spoke was Jesus the Christ. He is the one who was given credit for speaking everything into view. All right, now I guess we better go on into Abel at least. So by faith. Now here's the great faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. I told Iris I think I could almost spend four programs in chapter 11. Maybe we will, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd like to get moving on, but... Anyway, by faith, by simply taking God and his word, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Now, faith has always prompted God to declare that believer righteous. That's been the case ever since Adam and Eve back in Genesis chapter 3. And so Abel's faith prompted God to restore Abel into fellowship, and he declared him now a righteous individual. Now we start the next program. We're going to jump right back to Romans chapter 4 and see how that's Paul's primary example of Abraham. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. 
Okay, it's good to see everybody back in. And uh, again, we like to always welcome our television audience. And uh, yes, I'm going to be sitting down for this program. We're going to try it. And uh, I've been admonished to do this for a long time because for those of you on television, you know that on our seminars, I usually do teach from sitting on a stool. So we're going to try it this half hour. And if it works, well, we may just uh, continue because an afternoon gets to be quite a long. All right. For those of you joining us, though, we're just a simple Bible study, and uh, we don't attack folks. We don't try to claim that we've got all the answers, but uh, hopefully we can just open the scriptures and uh, let the Holy Spirit be the master teacher. Now, as we finish this program today, this will finish up book number 51. So for those of you out in television, if you want to order any of these programs, just call in or write and tell the girls that, you want tape or whatever of number 51. That means we've been on the air almost 12 years. Unbelievable in the honey. My, it's just like yesterday. We drove up here for the first taping and uh, had no idea it would go more than six months, let alone 12 years. Okay, for those of you on television, then we will continue on where we just left off in Hebrews chapter 11. And remember, this is the great faith chapter. All the 